afternoon. This is Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green. I am very fortunate today to have Peter Stone, president of Pohaku Consulting. And incidentally, what does Pohaku mean in Hawaiian? Stone. Get it? Peter Stone. And indeed, his profession is to make new residences, new single-family homes, as solid as stone in so far as their operating equipment goes. He is a building commissioner. Now, what in the world does a building commissioner do? When a new home is getting ready for occupancy, you know, it's still in the final construction phase, Peter goes into the home and tests everything to make sure that what is on the drawing boards, what is in the contractor's specs, is indeed there. And number two, to see if everything is working as it should. Well, you say, of course it's working as it should. It's right there on the plans. Most things are pretty simple. What's not simple is air conditioning. You've got your unit outside, and then you've got a whole bunch of ducts that take the cold air from the outside and put it in the living room, the kitchen, bedroom numbers one, two, three, the bathroom, the uh, dining room. And you say, what's so complicated about that? Well, the answer is there's a lot that can go wrong with air conditioning. And indeed, we found in the bad old days, I, I assume it's improved since then, that as much as 20% of a home's energy use was going up, not in smoke, but in cold air, because the air conditioning system was not installed as designed. Specifically, when you have ducts getting the cold air from here, there, and everywhere, Sometimes you find this hard to believe, but the contractor is encouraging his men to work very fast, and maybe those ducts are not sealed as they should be, and maybe you're directing cold air in leaks to areas where there shouldn't be cold air, and the home occupant is paying for it. That's the very, very simple version of what a home commissioner does, as we'll discuss in detail, there's a whole lot more that should be done and that Peter does. Peter, incidentally, is one of only two home commissioners that I know in this entire state of Hawaii. There may be more now, but Peter is somebody who's been around not since the Pleistocene, but from for a very, very long time, I assume that he has commissioned hundreds and hundreds of homes by now. He's seen everything. And as we get into the program, we're going to see some of those everythings that he has seen. Something else you might be wondering about is, why in the world is there air conditioning in a Hawaiian home? We have the most beautiful climate in the world. I just got back from southern Florida just yesterday and it just reinforced that fact. Yes, Hawaii has the most beautiful climate in the world. Even though we've been having this Kona weather and we're complaining about the humidity and so forth, we have nothing on South Florida. I began to take a walk at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning in Fort Lauderdale. And in Hawaii, 9 o'clock is still beautiful as anything. I broke out in a sweat within the first five or six minutes of that walk. That's South Florida. That's a lot of the U.S. And this is October. It's supposed to be cooling down. It still hasn't cooled down. Anyway, so Hawaii, most beautiful climate in the world. Why do we need air conditioning in it? Well, uh, Zuri, if you could bring up the first slide. When I was growing up, I had the great fortune, oh, oh, that, that's not it, Zuri. that's not it either, 
That's the one. Uh, yes, OK. Yeah, OK. So I grew up uh, in a yard that was one third of an acre. As a very young man, I was able to purchase a home that sat on a quarter of an acre. Thank goodness I still have that home. When you have a large yard, especially in a verdant area like Hawaii, you are separated from your neighbors. You're surrounded by vegetation that absorbs sound and cools the immediate atmosphere. Now, I encourage you to look at the top photo there. What in the world is that? Is that cancer metastasizing? No. That is a neighborhood on the Eva Plains, a new neighborhood. And you're seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes. The lot sizes are very, very small. I toured one site that had lot sizes of 1,850 feet, meaning that you could go out, you could reach out your window, and your neighbor could read out your window. I'm still uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit. And just about shake hands, you are very, very close to your neighbor. What in the, does that imply? It means that you, the sound you make in your home can be heard by your neighbor. And it means that the trade winds coming through are blocked by your neighbor's house, the neighbor on the other side, you're blocking his trade winds. The small lot size just uh, makes necessary air conditioning for privacy and the sound and because you're not getting any trade winds and you're not surrounded by verdant greenery to make your home cooler and uh, more, more private. Therefore, this is the reality that we have today. So people like myself would like to design homes. You see the graphic down on the lower left there. This is a home that is what's called passively designed. We ask ourselves, what do we want to do with Hawaiian home? We want to bring the trade winds in, and we want to block the sun out. And that design, you can't see the details, but it is designed exactly to do that. When you're stuck on a very, very small lot, you can do that, but again, you're going to have noise, sounds, and you're going to have uh, lack of privacy, lack of cooling. So that is not possible out on the Eva Plains there. So the Eva Plains instead are designed like the illustration on the lower right. And you'll say, well, that looks like a mainland home. Exactly. This is what the builders, given those constrictions, need to build to. Therefore, we need to design in that way and Air conditioning is, and I would say, if not an absolute must, certainly very close to an absolute must. Speaking of which, let me go back, and I just introduced Peter as president of Pohaku Consulting. Peter, could you start off by saying how you got into this business and give us a brief bio sketch of what you've done in this business and, and how your business has, has evolved. Sure. Um, I got into the business in 2009, uh, kind of as a career shift, wanted to do something different and really wanted to um, give back to, you know, I grew up here, I want Hawaii to succeed in the future and with our high cost of energy, um, getting efficient, trying to meet our goals of 70% you know, renewables by 2030, uh, I wanted to do my part in that. And I'm kind of interested in that whole sector. So I went and got myself trained as a HERS rater, which stands for Home Energy Rating System. And it was a program designed by essentially the mortgage industry on the mainland to give a home, for lack of a better term, sort of an MPG rating. So you could almost compare 
homes of different sizes and types to know approximately what kind of energy they would use. Now, M MPG is? Miles per gallon. Mm -hmm. So a HERS score can give you an idea of what the home that you're looking at, how it would perform based on a metric that is designed towards 100 being a code-built home, so whatever the current code is in the state. Mm -hmm. And if you have a HERS of 50, your home should, by all right, perform 50% more efficiently than a code-built home. Mm -hmm. And you got your rating, and then did something happen after that? I.e., did you get hired to actually yes. do Yes, and then yeah. I've uh, been working. I worked out on many of the um, homes being built on the Eva Plains in the new developments by Gentry, by D.R. Horton, by all of the uh, various developers, and uh, rated over 250 or so homes for Energy Star all new homes um, and going to what you said you know why air conditioning and one of the reasons I, I thought the same thing when I started but one of the reasons is number one it's very hot out there mm -hmm. and number two um, you know the the production builder has a business model they need to make a certain amount of money and it's nice to design to that passive cooling design but that's very expensive mm -hmm. and uh, they can you know barely afford to you know, buy the homes now as they're built just sort of very straight boxy type homes. So designing all those extra features would be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you mentioned Energy Star Homes. There are many, many different ways of rating homes for efficiency. What, what is Energy Star all about? Uh, Energy Star is a program that is run by both the EPA and the uh, Department of Energy jointly, and it's very similar to when you buy a new refrigerator or a new washing machine or a microwave or whatever it is, an appliance, you'll see the little blue Energy Star label on there. Um, what the Energy Star Homes program allows pers people like myself to do is once you go through and we make sure that all of the things that are required of the program are met by the home, it can actually get a label put on it saying this is an Energy Star home. In order to get that, it usually has to beat code by about 15% mm -hmm. in terms of its energy usage. So you mentioned uh, complying with the code. So in terms of points, a code compliant home might get uh, 100 points because in this case, is it the lower the better or the higher the better in, the, in this rating system? In this rating system, the lower the better. Yeah. It's the inverse. So if a code compliant home which meets the bare minimum of efficiency standards is 100 then an energy star home would be 85 correct and then what you're really looking for like when we buy an appliance we want that arrow to be more and more and more on the left yep what you're looking for is ideally points below 85 right yeah because they've done other things above and beyond they have, the Energy yeah. Star home. Yep. And the more you put in there, the more efficient you are, then the lower your energy bill essentially will be. Okay. On that cheery note, let's take a brief break and get into the details of this. Good. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to the environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Hi. on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. Greetings again. This is Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green. I have as my guest today Peter Stone, president of Pohaku Consulting. And for those of you who missed it at first, Pohaku is stone in Hawaiian. Get it? Peter Stone, Pohaku, and what he is striving to do is make new homes, especially on the Everplains, but I assume elsewhere, mm -hmm. 
as solid as stone from an energy rating standpoint. Now, one thing you mentioned, Peter, is that the rating system was instituted by the mortgage industry. Mm -hmm. And I assume that that's because when you and I are looking <clears throat> at a new home, refinancing, whatever, there's the appraisers come by and they have a whole checklist. Check, 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 check. You know, there's new refrigerator, the rug is okay, the roof is okay, so forth, so forth. I assume that the mortgage industry wants included a checklist on energy efficiency features of the home because the more efficient a home is, the lower the utility bill, the lower you, the utility bill, the greater the ability of the homeowner to pay his mortgage. Is that, is that a good summary? Or that's is an there excellent much summary, more? yes. Yeah. That's what they designed it for. Um, you know, various factors in the environment that they had no control over sort of derailed that in the beginning, but it's now starting to come back to be that exact thing where a buyer can qualify basically for more home if it's less uh, expensive to run that home. Mm -hmm. And do you know if the Hawaii Appraisers Institute is in fact including energy efficiency in its ratings? No. Not to my knowledge there. Uh, I was afraid you would say that. <laughs> I was recently at a uh, appraisal seminar and I tried to stress the importance of efficiency and I didn't get much uh, response. So that's definitely something we need to work on. Yeah, it's all about location, location, location. Yep, <laughs> yep, yep. And the recent sales in yes, around and the comparable. location. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. So if any of you out there can reform the mortgage industry, the appraiser industry, and get them to include efficiency, that you would be doing a great service to Hawaii. Now, I should mention, Peter mentioned that uh, the Eva Plains is hot. If you go back in Hawaiian history, pre-Captain <coughs> Cook, and look at the Apua'a system for Oahu, you will find on the windward coast all these teeny, teeny little slivers of Apua'a because that rainy coast was so fertile, so lush, and Ditto Manoa Valley, Nu'uanu Valley, and so forth. But you go out to the Eva Plains, and it is one huge Apua'a in and of itself. Why? The Hawaiians, hardly any Hawaiians live there because they didn't know to dig for fresh water there, and it was just hot and dry. Who in the world wants to live there? So, and as you know, that was became sugar land. Sugar dried up, literally. And so that is the only vacant space where builders can build on Oahu. So that's, that's why it's uh, going up there. Again, very hot, uh, very dry, which equals uh, the need for uh, air conditioning. Now, Peter, you mentioned the fact that you go in and rate, and there's a label. And when you and I build by appliances, we can see that energy efficiency label very clearly. Are new home buyers, or any home buyers, that have undergone the, the rating system, are they able easily to see that uh, label prominently posted? Um, prominently, I don't know. They, the typical place where they put that label is on the inside of the circuit breaker. Mm -hmm. So it will have a label about yay big, and it's on the inside of the circuit breaker. So if they're curious and they're looking inside there, but I don't know how many of them do that. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully the real estate agent would Hopefully. take them there yes. for efficient homes and open up the panel and say, see, look at how efficient th this home is. Yeah, it comes down to the builders and marketing it as well. They, mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. These are all on new homes. We can't do it on existing homes, so only on new homes. Oh, you, you can't rate existing homes? Or? Not for Energy Star. Uh, 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 okay. Okay, well that uh, takes care of that section. Uh, Zuri, if you could put up the slides that show a lot of fiberglass in them. Let's get into some specifics about what you, Peter, look for when you're rating a home. And let's first start with the things, the, the easy things, like insulation and 
When I first got involved with the Everplains Homes, we used to get, oh, I should have mentioned that I am with the State Energy Office, and my kuleana is to promote, among other things, energy efficient homes. We used to get a lot of calls. My home is so hot, I can't bear it. And especially on two-story homes, people would say, when I get home in the afternoon, I can't even go upstairs. And I was working with Hawaiian Electric at the time, and they drove through these new neighborhoods. This is about 15 years ago. And they would see people outside with the TV perched on the hood of their car, eating dinner off of TV trays. Why? Because when they got home, they had opened up all the windows and doors, and they were letting the cool air in so that the home was habitable. And we asked, why in the world are they getting so hot? Answer, this is 50, let's make it 20 years ago to be easy on people. They weren't insulating the homes. All that hot sun's radiation was coming right into the home and because it's all locked up for security, that heat is just sitting there. So, Peter, what do we do to prevent that heat from getting in? Um, well, one word, insulation. You know, when I first started it, it, people were already insulating homes and going, you know, above and beyond the typical things. But what a lot of people, myself included, before I got involved in all this was that most people assumed that insulation was meant to keep heat in, which it does, absolutely. It's very common in mainland for a long time. But it also keeps heat out. All insulation does is impede transfer of heat from one side to the other side. So it doesn't matter which way it's going, it's going to keep it from, from transferring into the home or out of the home. And so in our case, we were building lots of homes that had no insulation and they were just becoming big heat traps. So one of the things that <clears throat> um, the first projects that I got involved with, uh, there was already insulation going on um, and now there were some new theories coming out where since they had air conditioning in them that they might want to look at insulating the attic as well so on the inside of the attic space so if you look at that slide um, uh, Zuri could you bring <coughs> the photos up again on the upper right hand side there mm -hmm. is a picture of an inside of an attic where they've actually insulated under si underneath the roof deck there so bringing the equipment inside, making it work less hard, and making the attic a little cooler so that the heat doesn't transfer into the home as easily. Now, we're all familiar with fiberglass insulation, but that upper right-hand slide does not look like uh, fiberglass. What in the world is that? That is called spray foam insulation. And it's a new product. Well, not that new. It's been out for a while now. Uh, it is spray applied and so it's much easier to apply it more uniformly and evenly throughout a home. You can do it on the walls or in the ceiling or a combination with the fiberglass insulation. And it is polyurethane foam that's two parts. They put it together on a big gun and they spray it all in on the inside of the home to a you know, designated thickness and that um, then does its job as insulation. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very popular on those types of installations where you want to do it on the un underside of the roof deck because the fiberglass tends to fall out of there very easily mm -hmm. and the uh, spray foam does not. And in terms of fiberglass insulation, you're, you're just putting these slabs of fiberglass in and you might be missing some nooks and crannies. What does uh, spray foam do in terms of filling up nooks and crannies and so forth? Well, it's much easier to get the nooks and crannies, assuming it's applied correctly, and I've seen some applications that are better than others. Um, but if you look at some typical walls, uh, like the slide on the left, a lot of piping in there. Um, so there is piping for plumbing and for HVAC and things like that. With fiberglass insulation in that particular area would be very difficult. Again, these are homes that are built one after the other very quickly, so the installers are going through at a very rapid pace, and they're 
the fiberglass insulation is cut to a certain width that is a typical width that you would find in a home for what's called the bay in between the joists or the studs. And if that is compromised by a pipe or something in there, then they'll either have to cut around it or they'll squish it up and it won't, it won't be as effective. Can you, you go into some detail about that uh, slide on the left there? Yeah, so what we see is a, um, basically it's a steel frame wall and there are several vertical pipes running in between the stud bays and they are carrying either water or um, could be a plumbing from the second floor coming down. Um, and so that is hidden in the wall, which is nice, but if you were to put regular fiberglass insulation in there, you'd need to cut around that pipe to make it very effective. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot more time and a lot more effort, and frankly, it just doesn't get done unless mm -hmm. it's in a custom home. Now, looking at that slide on the left, I see a lot of uh, black areas. What, what is uh, that all about? Those are the pipes I'm referring to. This, th these are the mm -hmm. pipes there, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the, okay. the light silver areas are the metal studs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is another um, area that we can talk about that um, due to our termite problem out here, many people have gone to framing and building with steel, which mm -hmm. is very good uh, for its anti-termite properties. They don't really like it. However, uh, it does have the disadvantage in terms of heat. That, that metal heats up much quicker and transfers heat much quicker than wood does mm -hmm. through the wall system. Yeah, so when the sun hits that wall, let's say it's a west-facing wall and the afternoon sun hits it, the wall itself heats up, that heat gets to the metal, and as we know, metal conducts heat very, very nicely. Mm -hmm. So that heat transfers right into the interior where you don't want it. Right, yeah. and it does it at a much faster rate than wood does, mm -hmm. uh, and so a typical wall is about 23% of that wall is made up of studs. Mm -hmm. um, by most most uh, framing and building methods. And so, you know, if we don't have some way to block that heat, there are ways to do that uh, from transferring in, then it goes directly from out and just transfers right in through that drywall into the home. Yeah, yeah. And what is that uh, very attractive looking uh, slide on, on the bottom right there? Uh, that is a picture of some duct work that is also inside the attic space. I was uh, trying to show that there is, um, you know, there's ways to, with the spray foam, you can go around ducts much easier than you can, again, with the fiberglass insulation. Okay. Yeah, a, and a, yeah, well, let's, let's, on that cherry note, let's take a break, and then we'll get back into some of these fascinating details. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people are collaborating and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. This is Howard Wake. Greetings, Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green. I have as my guest this afternoon, Peter Stone, president of Pohaku Consulting, and he is a home commissioner, and we're talking about the fascinating details of home commissioning, which actually are fascinating because if a new home isn't built as it should be built, you could be losing as much, in my experience, as 20% of your utility bill or the energy in the utility bill going out where it shouldn't go. It's totally useless to you, but you have to pay for it anyway. It's Peter's job to make sure you're getting your money's worth when you pay your utility bill. Now, Peter, we were talking about uh, spray foam. You illustrated some of the problems with the fiberglass foam, have you run into problems with the spray foam also? Yes, um, it is a, it's a technical application process where there's a mixture of two different parts of chemicals, and if they don't get mixed properly, 
they will not stick, basically, to the wall system, and they can fall out just as easily as in the fiberglass can fall out. So it does, um, it is important to have, you know, the right person installing it that knows what they're doing, as well as an inspection to make sure that it is mm -hmm. put in properly. Uh, you can also miss spots. Uh, guys are moving fast. They might miss a spot, or it might be a really thin. It's unevenly applied. So there, there are some problems. There can be some problems, but overall, it performs much better um, using the diagnostic tools that I have at my disposal. I can pretty much always see when it's a fiber, uh, fiberglass versus a uh, um, spray foam. And speaking of diagno diagnostics. Zuri, if you could bring up the last photo, let's get into some of the intimate details of what you look for when you're going through a new home. And incidentally, it's the home builder who is paying Peter for this service to make sure that he can certify his home as being highly, highly energy efficient. Which, uh, which of those slides do you want to uh, start with, Peter, and t tell us what's going on with each each of um, Okay, well, we'll, tell, we'll start with the, the bottom right one first, which is that big red door there with a fan in it. Um, that is the main tool used to test for air infiltration. So what we're looking for is how much air will be leaking into or out of the home through all the various little nooks and crannies and, crav and cavities that are, that are present. And using this tool, we close up all the windows and all the doors and all the um, openings to the outside, um, hook up this fan and this door with a manometer, which is a pressure reading device. And through the wonders of higher math that I can't do, <laughs> it will translate what it reads in the difference in pressure to uh, a calculated airflow per minute. Mm -hmm. And the more warm air that's flowing into the house, the less effective your air conditioner is, and the harder it has to work just to make up for that warm air flowing in. That's is exactly that right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what happens <clears throat> if you don't get the proper pressure reading? Then, then what do you do? Well, then we can grab some other tools. Um, one of the easiest ways to go about it is to leave that fan running at a nice high speed so we're inducing an artificially high pressure, uh, which will then enable us to walk around the home and you can use your hand, which is actually a very good device, to try to sense where the, where the air is coming from, where do you feel it uh, arriving. You can go room by room. Uh, you can also use what's called a smoke stick, which mm -hmm. is a small little theatrical device that you can produce little puffs of smoke and it'll help immediately direct where the air is going. You can see that visually. Um, the other very handy tool that will work in certain circumstances, and I have to qualify it, but is um, in the upper right or upper left hand corner there, the um, very popular and very fun, always fun to look at infrared imaging device. Um, you can see in that particular one there is a spray foam that has kind of missed a little triangular section there and that's reading a bit warmer than everybody else. So the triangular section is that purplish uh, color? Uh, it's the whitish color in the middle. Oh, oh right right in the middle there. Yes. Yeah. So the different colors that people are looking at denote different uh, temperatures that are coming. Right, yeah. they do. And mm -hmm. there are some very uh, easy mistakes to make with an infrared imaging camera that uh, I see all the time people talking about it because they're very sexy, they're fun to look at. You can see and it looks like, you know, this huge problems, but uh, you, you do need to know how to use those properly. So in this case, when you see that white triangle and it's emitting too much heat, what, what do you do about it? So what I have usually do when I'm out doing the, uh, the first inspection that I do is usually right at uh, before drywall goes up so we can get in there and see things that are insulated. Uh, there's usually somebody on the site, if it's a big production builder, who can come over with even just a small can of spray foam mm -hmm. or their big machine if, they, if it's a big spot uh, and just simply fill it in. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. So we get there and I have found places, uh, particularly where duct work will go inside the envelope to the outside of the envelope, uh, lots of problems there trying to seal mm -hmm. that up. What do you do when you detect a similar problem with fiberglass? 
Uh, same thing, I will ask the fiberglass installer to come and make it right, add, add more fiberglass to that spot. Mm -hmm. um, the fiberglass is not a very good air barrier, whereas mm -hmm. spray foam is a much better air barrier. So with fiberglass, you're going to see a lot of air moving in at, at that point. Um, it, and that's something that I've often been battling with, um, with the various builders and the way they build the homes, is if they just put simple house wrap on top mm -hmm. of steel studs or wood studs, and then they'll put what's called lap siding, which has all that nice gap on the mm -hmm. inside of it, mm -hmm. uh, very easy for air to get into that wall system. Um, and that's not the typical way that they're built on the mainland, but that's the way they're doing it out mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. The other uh, tool that I use most often would be on the lower left corner there. It's mm -hmm. not a very good photo, but um, there's a smaller fan system with a tube running up to it, and I can basically test the um, air conditioning system, so the duct system, uh, looking for leaks. And what I will do is, using the same pressure testing device that I use on the big door, set it differently, and you can check for how much uh, air is leaking and if it's too much. The other handy thing to use is um, a theatrical fog machine, which is a non-toxic, makes some smoke. You blow it into there and then wherever that smoke starts pouring out, you pretty much know where your holes are. And as I have understood it from lectures, the greatest leaks occur at junctions where you have to do a 90 degree turn, something like that. Yes, if they're using uh, duct box work, so they're making it you know, straight and then turning this way, um, the, most of the homes that I'm dealing with out here are all using what's called flex duct, mm -hmm. flexible duct work, uh, which doesn't have a lot of junctions there. So unless there's been a hole poked in it, there's really not um, much to see there. Where I usually find the problems in those systems is actually in the air handler unit itself. Mm -hmm. And what, what problems tight. are... With They're the just handling. not very sealed very tightly from mm -hmm. the factory. Mm -hmm. And it's not often the ARC contractor has much they can do about it. Sometimes they can go in and put a little aftermarket taping, which I've done mm -hmm. recently on a job. And as far as the flex duct goes, it's this great round tube, and you just guide it wherever you want to. I have seen examples of trying to do like 180 degree turns or even more than that with the flex duct. What, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is that you are going to severely impede your airflow. So mm -hmm. what you want to do when you are designing a system, uh, presumably the you know, engineer who's designing the duct work is going to say, okay, this room is the farthest one from you know, their handler. We need an X amount of flow to get to that room. And they're assuming that it's going to be a nice straight run all the way to that room, but I have also seen ones that go like this and like this and up around mm -hmm. here and in there. And every time they make a turn, they're losing, you know, it's making a whole bunch of turbulence and the pressure is going up in that duct system. And by the time it gets to that register at the very far end of the home, you've got about a, a third to a half of what they were expecting mm -hmm. in terms of airflow. And there, therefore, the occupant, if the air isn't getting into that far home, what does he do? He turns up the AC. He turns up the AC yeah. and there goes his electric bill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is an integral part of the type of work that you do. Absolutely. When, when you see these great big turns, can you go to the contractor and say, hey, this is not the way you should do it, Just straighten it out? Or um, I certainly can suggest that. I, have, I make my reports and mm -hmm. I usually mm -hmm. photo document everything. Uh, in the end, I am not a... Um, you know, a city or a state sanctioned code official that can go in there and say you must do this, mm -hmm. but I do inform them of their best practices yeah. and that they really should change that. And we're getting to the end. What is this? Uh, oh, Zuri, if you could bring the uh, images up once again. We oh, have yeah. uh, the up on the upper right hand corner. What in the world is all <laughs> that about? Well, that is just to show that, you know, one of the best tools we have are our are simply our eyes. And in this particular case, uh, what was discovered is this is where a garage is coming up against a second story living space. So the small sort of light triangular area there would be the attic above the garage. 
that you can see down into the garage there, and there is just some insulation put into that bay. Uh, what we are trained as home inspectors and energy raters is that insulation alone, particularly fiberglass, is not an air barrier, and so the hot and humid air that will be behind that will just simply come right on into the wall system and then flow around there at ease. And my biggest concern there is the hot and humid air could potentially meet a very, let's say that room was super cooled for some reason. Mm -hmm. They had the AC up very high, it was very effective. Uh, the stud, that steel stud could be behind there getting very cool and now you have a cool surface mm -hmm. and warm hot air and what happens there? Water, dew point. Just cut, like when cut. you take your soda can out of the refrigerator and put it on the, mm -hmm. on the uh, particularly in these days. And what, the table. and what happens when you have condensation in an interior spot? So if you've got condensation in an interior spot, you've got water, and mm -hmm. water is going to breed what? Mold, mildew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now we have a health and safety concern as well as just an mm -hmm. energy concern. So you're concerned not just with energy efficiency per se, but you, you are on the outlook for, for health and safety also. Yes, and yeah. in fact, one of the things that is the biggest challenge that we're running into now is we're running around telling builders, build these very tightly controlled homes with mm -hmm. these diagnostic mm -hmm. tools we have. We can say that's a very nice and tight home. Okay, now you need to ventilate it. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. look at you like you're crazy because you just told me to make it all tight. Mm -hmm. But we, if we're going to be recirculating a bunch of stale air in the home, that's not going to make for very happy people either. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole other side, and there's, you know, HVAC, the V in that stands for mm -hmm. ventilation. And that's a whole other topic we could yeah. probably go into. Yeah. So if you do, most of us are familiar with the need to ventilate through uh, from airplanes, yes. where everybody says somebody in the airplane is sick, the germs are going around and around and around, and therefore I'm getting sick. And to a much lesser extent, that could be true in a home. Absolutely. You're just recirculating the same old stale air that mm -hmm. maybe somebody in the home is sick. Yeah. And it wasn't as big a concern when the home was very leaky and had lots of air coming in mm -hmm. from the outside. We had lots of fresh air. But now, the homes are much tighter. So, so you actually purposely need a vent to come in to bring the outside air in. Yes. But in this case, you can control where it's coming in and you can minimize the Absolutely. potential and how for often and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can bring in just, just the, the right amount. So as a good wrap up, do you have every person I've talked to you in the commissioning field or the inspection field always has a horror story. Do you have any horror stories that you came across a home and said, who in the world is in charge of this? Um, sure. Uh, I was recently at a home that was a custom-built home. It's going to be in Kahala, very mm -hmm. expensive. Spray foam throughout the whole thing. Spent a lot of money on that. Really good windows. Everything beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the person was there installing the um, air conditioning system. And I didn't have any information on that at that point, so I asked him very nicely, what, what are you putting in there? And he gave me the specifications on it, and I about dropped my bag because what he was, the amount of, the size of the system he was putting in there would have been sufficient for probably four homes that size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was going to be a vastly, vastly, way too large a system for that home. Um, Yes, it was a large home. It's Kahala. It's 3,000-something square feet. However, he had about nine tons of air going in there. Mm -hmm. And so I pulled the builder aside, and I politely told him that I can't pass this home. And so we had to change it out. Yeah. And so presumably the owner was able to save money and certainly looking down the road was able to save on his utility bills. Absolutely. Yeah. And on that cheery note, we need to wrap up. Think Tech Hawaii Code Green, Peter Stone, President, Pohaku Consulting. And I just want to emphasize that in the end, Peter is rating homes just like you rate a car for miles per gallon, you rate a refrigerator for efficiency. If you are interested in a new home, please ask the realtor about the energy efficiency of that home to make sure that somebody like Peter has inspected it. 
Thank you very much. See you next time.